<clears throat> I have seven o'clock on my little wrist. Uh, we have a quorum as well, I think. You do. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on Wednesday uh, instead of Thursday. It was Steve's idea, but I thought it was a great idea. So, um, my wife's very happy. She's having her kids and grandkids over tomorrow for Irish dinner. So, perfect. <laughs> Good for you. All right. Um, so, DPW will be uh, <clears throat> presenting tonight. So, I'll call the meeting to order and uh, I'll see if there is any public participation. Okay. I don't see any. Very good. Adding a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Just trying to keep up your batting order, Dan, from some time prior. Exactly. So we have uh, two meeting minutes. The first one was the town hall meeting minutes. Uh, it was put together by Evan, and there are members from the town hall subcommittee. If you want to um, make a motion I on the one on those, don't believe we have a quorum of that subcommittee yet. Yes, I was okay. about to say that. <laughs> Thank We're you. missing two. You know, I keep track. <laughs> we need one more. <laughs> I see. Sorry, there's four of you. Yep. Okay, we'll defer that. <clears throat> the second set of minutes uh, we were looking to uh, review and approve would be the March 3rd, 2020, 2022 meeting minutes. So I move to accept. A second. Who moved uh, to accept? Is that you, Bill? Thank you. Yeah. And, and any discussion? Dan? Dan seconded. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Bill and Dan, thank you. Um, any comments? <clears throat> Steve, I don't know if you want to edit it. The only comment I had, item number five, it talks about schools. It says the proposed budget also, then it says 363, must also oh, okay. have or must also include Includes. or something. Okay, yep. I'll make that change. Thank you. Can I just ask Steve, and I appreciate you noting this in the minutes, you know, you know, the subject of some metrics around the Board of Health budget were brought up. Are those going to be provided? Uh, I will work with the Board of Health on that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments? Someone like to make a motion to accept. I have a motion by Mr. Booth. Sorry, no more other comments. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry, was there was there a motion yet, Steve? I'm sorry. Yep, there's yeah, a that... motion and seconded. And, Can you hear uh, me? Yep, I heard you. We're all good. Yep. And I think you took the vote, too. Yeah, I'm sorry. My internet seems like it's going in and out. So I, I will take a vote. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Anybody opposed? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, tonight's finance committee is uh, going to see the DPW budget. Uh, I uh, chair the subcommittee. I did put minutes out. Uh, as we encourage everybody to try to get minutes out ahead of the meeting. So myself, Stefan, uh, Dennis, and David spent some time um, last week with the team that's uh, on the call. And we reviewed both the uh, articles and the uh, budgets themselves. And uh, again, you see my write-up. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, the team... Uh, went through it uh, pretty in depth and key items. Uh, the overall budget is 2.3. There is an outstanding union contract that could affect that uh, on the DPW side. There are no uh, new employees uh, in the budget and uh, many lot items are level funded and uh, the team will go through all of that. Uh, on the enterprise side, enterprise uh, numbers were in really good shape. Uh, Negative for the uh, water and uh, slightly 1.6 for the uh, sore with the MWRA assessment for water down, which uh, obviously impacted that. And then the snow and ice budget, uh, it's coming in at one uh, level funded again. Uh, and they'll get into that a little bit. The uh, department heads 
always seem to request more than the 850 and then there's discussion and that gets reconciled. I don't know if anybody else from the subcommittee has additional comments they'd like to add. Oh, oh thank. Very good. David, I got you, thanks. All right, I'll turn it over to uh, either Joe or uh, Bill, who's gonna start? Um, I can I can start, Kevin, I know you don't have anything to add beforehand, do you? Nope, go right ahead. All right, so um, thank you everybody uh, for inviting us in tonight. So um, for those who may not know me, my name is Joe Conway. I'm the public works director here in town. With me on the call tonight is Ann Wade, our business manager, and Bill Renault, uh, town engineer. So what we have planned uh, to talk about tonight, uh, for anybody that might have tuned into the council on Monday, um, these talking points and presentation will look relatively similar. Uh, we'll go through the budget. I'll start with tax and then head into the enterprises. Um, Mr. Chair, if, if you want to stop in each segment or have me keep going, you tell me. Uh, we can pause it at any time the committee would like. Uh, getting right into it. So uh, as mentioned, we'll start with the tax side. So personal services for tax, uh, our net increase was 83,884. The big driver with this is contractual increases uh, for steps and things like that. Uh, cost of living for the supervisors union and clerical union. Uh, as the chair mentioned, uh, the laborers right now are still unsettled. Um, so that could be subject to change. Uh, I'm hoping that they can make a decision on the relative short term. If that's the case, uh, we'll be back to see you uh, again. So excuse me, Joe, does the does the group need it shared or everybody has access, I assume? Uh, I'm just reading off some, some talking points, but I can go through, I could share what I'm reading if you want. Uh, no, no, I was just wondering on the budget, whether you wanted me to uh, show the uh, spreadsheet. Uh, I'm, I'm asking the rest of the, the group. I've got my own copy. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you. Okay. And in the packet, Joe's uh, letter, uh, his comment letter, I believe, was in the packet. So go right ahead, Joe. Thanks. Okay. Um, staying in the tax side, the purchase of services, uh, the increase is up 57,520. Uh, There's a small, small increase uh, in the administrative division, some software licensing, uh, but some things that Ann and I use uh, for finance is up a tad bit. Um, the biggest uh, increase in this is for electricity and natural gas uh, at $41,020. Um, for those of you who heard this, this is before, this is the same approach as my predecessor. Uh, for those who haven't, just to provide some context, uh, how we come up with this, this budgetary number is we take a multi-year consumption average, uh, review both uh, the federal publications on short-term energy outlooks, and then we have a conversation with the municipal gas and light department to kind of figure out where they think the ceiling for the rates might be for a year. We take that multi-year average based off of the rate that we come up with after we talk to the light department and that funds our budget. Uh, an interesting piece that we're gonna be paying attention to this year though I will add is that the herd school is going to be turned into swing space. I should say it's in the process of being turned into swing space right now to support the public safety building renovation. Um, so that building will be coming back online. So as we move on into the year and into next year, this average might fluctuate a little bit uh, to that. In forestry and parks, we have an increase of $5,000. That's largely for crane rentals uh, and specialized equipment related to tree removal. Uh, we benefited from the aggressive street tree program from Gas and Light uh, and our own hired contractors. What we're finding is some of the public shade trees that we have left are hard to reach and require somebody with a little bit more specialized uh, equipment to get those out safely. And then lastly, uh, in the highway division, we have a $9,000 increase. Uh, two segments here, traffic lines were increasing $3,000. Uh, the reason for this is historically, this is a budget line item that we've always overspent. And with projects like the Envision piece, um, that is going to be an expanded scope and probably get a little bit more expensive if time goes on. So we're just trying to bridge that gap incrementally as we go. And then in catch basin cleaning, we have an increase of $6,000. And then the contract for fiscal 23, we're actually changing the scope so that the contractor that comes in and helps us with that 
will also be performing uh, an asset inspection for every manhole and um, drainage structure that they touch. The materials and supplies, uh, this is largely level funded. Uh, the increase here, 9630, uh, is from motor vehicle fuel. Uh, the same methodology for fuel is uh, what we use uh, with electricity and natural gas. So this is our multi-year average times by a projected cost. Snow and ice, uh, as the chair mentioned, uh, we are asking for level funds. Um, if you play the averages and go back uh, off of you know, what your average uh, winter is here in Wakefield, although we have had a few good years, um, the budget would have been 1.544 million. Um, given the, you know, a lot of talk this year about the lack of snowplow drivers, uh, inflation and fuel costs and things like that, it's probably prudent to start think about uh, incrementally bumping that up now a little bit, just so we make sure that we don't fall too behind and we can stay competitive uh, with getting contracted help if we need it. So uh, that's it for the tax side. If you want me to keep going to the enterprises, Jim, I can keep moving or we could pause here. Yeah, why don't we, uh, why don't we pause? Uh, so again, you should have uh, the write-up that Joe was sort of referring to given the highlights and obviously you have the budget. So if anybody has any questions that they want to run through uh, on the tax side for DPW, and uh, you know, the spreadsheet, if you're looking at it, it is, um, it's done pretty well, kind of similar in nature. There's a lot of tabs that kind of break everything down. So uh, it's got a wealth of information. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question um, for um, the Herd School. What What is going to be accommodated in the world in the Herd School as it relates to the build out of the public safety building? What, what's anticipated there? So uh, I believe, I know for definite, um, some of the administration and the detectives are moving into there because they're in wings of the public safety building are gonna be basically gutted and completely rehabbed. Um, so they need, they need space to conduct their daily business. Um, outside of you know, keeping the building online so the pipes don't freeze, um, the heat has been relatively you know, off for the most part there. You add, you know, the human element into it now, and you know that would probably increase a little bit as well as the electricity because they'll be working out of that building for the large majority of the day. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Dan, can you hand up? Yeah. Um, so I was going through um, the personnel changes. I noticed a comment regarding the difficulty of of hiring people, and yep. I'm wondering if that explains. I'm looking at forestry and parks and overtime. There's a substantial increase in your budget for um, overtime and it, what's called additional assigned duties, although dollar is pretty low. And I also noticed um, in the same vein, a large increase for um, a mechanic that you're trying to find, um, you know, the posted salary versus what it was um, a year or well, the current fiscal year. So are you finding that um, you have to raise, um, you know, pay rates and so forth to attract people and the lack of people is why that was driving the overtime budget? Um, so to speak to the overtime first, um, we're seeing the, the amount of work that is online right now is done nothing but increase, uh, even with the pandemic, it seems like we're getting busier and busier by the day. Um, related to the forestry and parks, like you said, uh, one of the bigger increases in that is we budgeted for more days of putting our forestry folks on call. Um, they receive one seventh of uh, you know what every other division would receive. If we know that we're getting heavy winds, we basically use it as an insurance policy for ourselves to guarantee that we're going to have four people show up and take care of anything that might cause us an issue. Um, related to the, the labor and things like that, the, the one thing that we were able to concentrate on and worked pretty heavily in. Uh, over the last two years was investments uh, in ourselves and the human capital piece to public works. So we're trying to get our folks uh, educated, more professional uh, and bring a higher level of service to the town. For whatever reason though, um, you know, the, the economy is the economy and it is a little bit difficult. Uh, I'll tell you that we probably had six or eight job offers go out there that had been turned down, which has been a first, uh, certainly for me. And that was uh, also 
relate to me from human resources. Uh, for whatever reason, people are either job shopping or, or whatnot. Like the, the days of the long line of people waiting just to get in uh, to get a job at the DPW don't seem to be completely there. Um, related to the mechanics position specifically, um, that's something that to find somebody in that vocation um, that you know has a resume worthy of, of being in the shop is something that has been tough. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to compete with somebody who's getting uh, flat rate at a dealership. And essentially what that is for anybody that doesn't know is um, we'll take a break job, for example, that might pay four hours. If somebody at Ford does that job in two hours because they're good at what they do, they're still getting the four hours of pay. So they have the ability to hustle and make substantial more money. Uh, I will say we had a good round of interviews related to that this week, and we're planning on making an offer um, either tomorrow or Friday. So that position should essentially be filled, I would think, by this time next week. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Very good, thanks. Uh, Bill? Is, um, is all the equipment maintenance done in-house? Yes, the large majority of it. Um, every once in a while, you will see something that we can't handle. Um, a recent example is one of our front end loaders, they, they swing on a hinge pin in the middle of the machine. Um, we don't have the ability to take that apart. Yeah. And so we send out something specialized like that, but the bulk majority of all the work to our vehicles and all the other uh, divisions in town, with the exception of the fire trucks, uh, we cover inside fleet. Painting can be done outside now too, right? Uh, the fire department, Dennis? No, painting. painting oh, is yes. Yeah, painting is uh, something that's done outside because our paint shop uh, was essentially shut down because it was venting uh, right towards the middle school. Very good, uh, Doug Butler. Um, just a quick question on the whole fleet maintenance. It looks like you put in sort of 10% price increases for sort of gas and fuel. But if we look at that fuel motor vehicle spending through 1231, you're like only at about 35%, 36% maybe of, of your budget for this year. Um, and like given that prices essentially have risen, they've risen a lot in the last you know, month, but they also had risen a fair bit year over year uh, for the previous, you know, previous six months. Um, I guess the question is, is if you're gonna only do 80 or 90,000 in spend this year, uh, do you really need to go up since it looks like you're gonna fall well short of it this year? Hi. I would say if you, if you saw the updated budget report uh, from this last warrant that went out, uh, this line item, uh, if not heading over, will be over uh, relative this year in that. So one of the things with the last two years, this budget, um, if we have a light year in snow and we're not driving around uh, pushing the white stuff off the streets, the fuel is obviously, we see a considerable savings there. Um, this year we've been out 23 times for service related to that. So you're naturally gonna see uh, an increase in, in diesel fuel consumption with that. So um, based off of that in the multi-year averages that we use, we felt it was important to at least bump that up for ourselves. So we don't get ourselves into too much of a budgetary jam this time next year. So help me understand. So the, the fuel expenditures don't go via snow and ice. The snow and ice budget is just for contractors. Contractors. Um, and over time. Over time. Uh, materials related to snow and ice, like cutting edges and wear parts and things like that, I guess. Okay. Anybody else? All right, you wanna go into the enterprises. Perfect. So um, I'll start with sewer first because that's the first one on my sheet right in front of me. Um, so Mr. Chairman covered most of uh, what I really had to talk about, but just to review um, our sewer, preliminary sewer assessment has increased from the MWA at 2.3% for 106,910. Um, as was stated earlier, the sewer assessment represents about 75.5% of our sewer enterprise budget. Uh, I 
I think the, the telling thing with this year's request on the totals page in front of the budget was uh, if you discount the impact that the MWRA had, um, the sewer division is requesting for less than one half a percent uh, of an increase. Um, these are self-funded, uh, self-sustaining budgets. So we see some increases related to group insurance and some of the, the benefits pieces that I'm, I'm sure you've all reviewed when you're reviewing those budgets. Um, and then the, lastly on the sewer, we have a decrease in the debt of $50,813. So, and then just quickly on, on the water side, um, our assessment is down. 7.4% uh, um, is twofold uh, impact here. So one of the things we saw when the, when the pandemic drove everybody to their homes was essentially that our consumption uh, increased because nobody was going to work. Uh, the rate field is largely residential and everybody being home meant that more was going to be tapped. Um, the other thing is that we have been trying to come up with you know, the best strategy for maximizing the output that we can get out of a treatment plant uh, so those two things combined, you know, the COVID pandemic sort of relieving itself a little bit and then uh, getting better at pumping when peak consumption is happening has attributed to that decrease. Um, on the water side, the MWRA represents about 42.5% of our budget. And I had mentioned uh, the insurance and things like that because they're self-sustaining. Uh, a larger increase on the water side this year uh, is 43748 uh, for benefits for enterprise employees. So it's short and sweet, but um, that basically concludes the talking points that I had on the enterprises. Very good. Doug, is your hand still up or uh, are you good? My hand would be up, but I'll let whoever was in front of me go before, me, before I go again. Very good. Uh, Ed, please. Yep. Uh, thank you, Doug. Um, so on the revenue side for the enterprise funds, how do you set rates? You set rates to recover full cost or more than full cost to develop retained earnings? I'm kind of curious because I don't see any revenue estimates here. No, so part of the, um, part of the rate setting experience uh, over the last few years, we presented to the council. So, so first thing, um, I'll just touch on the assessments. Those are preliminary. So those are the first pass from the MWRA before they get a final vote on the budget. Uh, generally, uh, it has been passed uh, practice that those assessments go down. Once we get the final assessment sometime in June, uh, we'll come up with a rate revenue requirement, and then we'll set the rates based on that. Um, we've spent a lot of time trying to mimic the town's financials, and get ourselves to a goal of 10% retained earnings, and also be able to funnel capital. So that would be something that's been done uh, independent to this through the month of yeah, mid-May to late June. And who sets the race? Do you set it, uh, Joe, or is it uh, voted on by the council? And do I just, I don't know the procedure here. Wait. Oh, sure. So um, we come up with um, basically a whole bunch of scenarios. Uh, there's a public meeting, uh, a bunch of, it's been multiple rate hearings in the last few years. Uh, the Advisory Board of Public Works weighs in, gives us some of the comments uh, that they're receiving from the general public, and then they make a vote on a recommended rate structure for the council. We take that recommended rate structure, present it to the council uh, with some background information, and then the town council would set the rates uh, via their vote at a rate hearing sometime in June. Thank you. Welcome. Very good. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Doug. Sure, and this gets to uh, sort of a follow on questions from Ed's. Again, you know, I think it was either last year or two years, it was two years ago that you came in and sold the group on this new rate structure and how it was going to be essentially really affecting and impacting only the super highest use members. And that just really has not been the case uh, across the board. And, you know, the, the water rates have, I, by the way, I, I'm always astonished the council doesn't push you on this because I th would think this is the one thing that the townsfolk would be coming at them with pitchforks for because it, it really feels like we really ratcheted up the water rates without and really yeah, essentially turned the screws on anybody who's got 
you know, frankly, probably more than three people in their house, not, not based on usage from COVID, but really based on where you set the numbers being, where you set the breakpoints, set it at an artificially low level. Uh, so I could tell you as part of that process, um, when we decided to do that rate study initially, um, you know, I was newly appointed. Uh, we had been talking about it for a little while before that point, um, but it felt right to have some fresh eyes come in and basically audit both the water and sewer enterprises. Part of the discovery in that process is we actually fall subject to an MGL that requires conservation-based rates. Uh, after consulting with uh, town council, um, we were kind of under the opinion that we, we didn't really have any other choice but to comply with that. Uh, it's also mentioned in our withdrawal agreement from the MWRA. I will say though that- Town council the lawyer or town council the, the body? No, Mullen. no, I, I, asked, I asked Tom Mullen uh, if he knew it had any more background on, on the law that we found that dictated that. Uh, and if you knew of, of anybody that suffered any penalties that was made aware of that and you know, deliberately uh, went in a different direction. Um, Tom being a lawyer uh, obviously advised us to follow the law so we don't get ourselves in a jam. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to have to go to DOR and have to explain myself if, if there became a problem down the road. Yeah, it's just that's sort of, you know, by the way, did Tom find anybody? No, of course he did. I can nope. answer that. For you. He found no one who was suffering from this. And it, it's, we're out, we went out on a limb by ourselves here. And that, I don't blame you, Joe, for that. There's, there's other people at this table that I might blame for that. But uh, so, Doug, yeah. I'll tell you the other thing. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, we took, we try to take the utilitarian approach for everything we do, right? We want to do as much good for the most amount of people as we can. Uh, in doing that, with the discussions of the advisory board, we looked at a lot of different tier thresholds. Um, those are obviously always subject to change every year. Uh, if, if the council uh, or even the advisory board for that matter uh, was hearing something similar to, to what you're relaying now and they said that, you know, tier one is too low, tier, tier one is too high or something like that, um, that could certainly be something that's subject to change via the public process. Um, so I would say if, if you're hearing that and think that there's something more efficient, I'd love to get the information from you and you know make that happen. I mean, I think we're, we put the, what nobody has is the information you have in terms of what the average water rate, the average water bill increased, you know, on the average single family house or the median. I, I mean, I think that's where we that's where we all struggle is understanding where the, the break points were supposedly. When it was sold, it was sold as like maybe 10 or 15% of households would hit that tier three. And my guess is probably 50% of households hit that tier three. Or 50% of houses hit that tier three, not like people in apartments, because you know they don't use it a lot. Sure. I don't have that number in front of me. Um, yeah. That's something that we can provide uh, if you're interested in. I know when we, when we were originally doing it, uh, if memory serves me correct, uh, what the billing data told us uh, over a three-year period, we essentially looked at about 100,000 bills. About 30% of the data that we had uh, fell into tier one and didn't exceed it at that time. Uh, but that will certainly be something that will show up in the presentations as a compare and contrast now that we've had basically two years under our belt with this. Right. I guess that's from next time we would like, we probably, this group more so than probably town council would want to see the revenue forecasts as well and the rate sure. set. We can provide all that. Very good. That's a great point. Uh, Ed, again? Just one quick question, um, for just for my knowledge. Do we have um, a re just simply a residential rate, or do we have different tiers for commercial entities? We currently do not split uh, commercial entities. I do know that is something that the Board of Selectmen at the time uh, reviewed, I believe, in the early to mid-90s, and it was decided to go again. <coughs> Uh, that methodology. At that point in time, uh, they thought that it would be counterproductive with trying to bring business into town. Um, I will say, if you know that's something, a decision like that were to be made, um, our commercial base is relatively on the small side. Um, we would have to forecast that and give you projections on what that offset could look like uh, if we were asked to come up with that. Mm -hmm. 
And Joe, who conducted the race study? Was it the Abrahams group? Yes, they did. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan. Yeah, I've got a question regarding the health insurance increases. Um, one of the things that I, I thought when I saw the um, health insurance preliminary budgets, it was um, roughly a 6% increase in total health insurance. But for the water and the sewer department, if both, both of those went up a little over 10%. And so I thought I'd see some kind of a change in um, you know, the personnel if you added anybody to water or sewer divisions, but I didn't see that. So I'm, I'm a little curious as to, and maybe this is a question for Kevin or Steve, is why did the uh, water and sewer departments both get a 10% increase, whereas the total budget was up 6.4, but they didn't add any people? Uh, on the on the tax side, Dan, the uh, the the rate did go up for health care. I think it was like six and a half percent. But yeah, that, six, yeah, six point four. But that six and a half percent included a large reduction in the OPEB, which is part of the health insurance budget. Um, so in reality, you're looking at like an, an average eight or nine percent increase. Um, for health insurance. Got and it, because the 1.4 million is a zero and pulls it down. Exactly. Got it, okay, that, that'll that do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I think the takeaway then is uh, Steve and, and Joe uh, to talk about the revenue stream uh, in the future for the uh, enterprise accounts. Sure. As the group wants, um, I have some pretty detailed uh, presentation decks uh, that we did with the Abrahams group that will kind of shed a little of light into the um, financials and what we were seeing at the time, albeit um, it is not Reader's Digest. It's a little bit more detailed than that, but um, it's certainly not a spreadsheet with you know 5,000 lines on it either. But I could provide that uh, maybe through you, Mr. Chair, and you could share it to see sort of the level of analysis that we're conducting when uh, those discussions come up. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, I know as Doug, Doug alluded to it, and uh, I think I've already uh, didn't recall, so that'd be great. Okay, so um, we're, we're gonna move on if there's no more questions on, uh, tax side and enterprise side. Okay, Joe, your call, you wanna do uh, refuge and, and then uh, articles or? Uh, yes, so Mr. Chairman, we have uh, the presentation that the subcommittee saw we were just gonna go through. Uh, it's a little bit yep. more interesting than listening to me talk uh, the whole time. So uh, if Mr. Mayo doesn't mind, could you make me eligible to share my screen if I can't already? I will do that, sir. You should be able to stream now. Okay, so can everybody see the um, slide deck in front of me with, uh, with, with a couple of gate valves and some construction work? Yep. Okay. Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. I got to give uh, all the credit goes to Bill on this one. He was the creative director here. But um, so this is our Warren articles. Um, this year we have five uh, that we're asking for. There was a sixth that was on deck for roadway betterment. Uh, the neighborhood still had some things that they had to discuss. Uh, so that was uh, deferred for right now. So just to briefly touch over it, you'll see some town-wide uh, drainage improvement requests, um, a topic that we're all very familiar with related to the quiet zone at Broadway. We we'll have a conversation about the Hearts Hill water storage tank. Uh, refuse and recycling and everybody's favorite one dollar article for eminent domain mm -hmm. so to kick this off i'm probably going to pass the baton to bill right now and he will go through uh, drainage and be quiet sure thanks joe good, good evening everybody bill renault uh town engineer so um 
I'm starting off, basically what we've done is identified, um, you know, essentially three major buckets of, of drainage improvements that we need townwide. Um, and we, you may recall from one of our older presentations when we started up the roads program and the, the, that bonding authorization, we talked about uh, looking at the existing utilities and the roads prior to paving. So um, as part of, our, of that due diligence work before we get into these streets, we identified a, a, a few areas um, really that needed some significant improvements. Um, and that's why we pulled these out as separate uh, as a separate article. So um, we, we identified a, um, a, a cross culvert in Daniel Road initially um, a couple of years ago that we needed to do. So we actually pushed and deferred the Daniel Road paving. Um, and then in this past fall, we identified a second area, which is in the same, essentially the same drainage run. Uh, so between the, um, the 201 and 203 Vernon Street um, uh, houses, you can see from the slide, uh, basically, the drainage system was overrun in, in what I would consider to be a, a you know a fairly routine storm, uh, washing out um, the existing pipe that was in the that goes between um, those houses, and um, you know undermining both of their driveways. Um, we you know identified basically started looking into see what that problem would be. Looked at the watershed, um, identified really a sizable watershed that contributed to the problem. So um, you know basically the drainage goes from Vernon Street through a cross country drainage system going underneath Daniel Road and then eventually dumping into the headwaters for the Mill River. And um, you can see from the, from the slide here, um, essentially the size of the watershed getting there um, includes portions of Pleasant Street and, and all the way up to Sweetser and um, you know, taking most of Wave Ave and, and Lawrence as well. So um, Joe, if you can bump to the next slide. So in the analysis, we had to look at, you know, really how would we be able to correct this so, so it, um, you know, the drainage system would function properly. So we identified um, basically a series of upgrades to the existing system um, to capture the drainage within the watershed and, and convey it down into the mill, um, the mill river. So um, the, what's shown in yellow on the screen is, is existing um, an 18 inch pipe, upsizing that to a new 24 inch pipe. Um, the section in red um, that varies between a 12 and a 30 inch pipe that would be upgraded to, um, I'm sorry, it's a 12 inch pipe today that would be upgraded to a 30 inch pipe. And then um, essentially from um, where you see the red, the blue and the green would both be um, 30 inches upgraded to 36. So uh, that's about a $475,000 project to, to do that work. And that upgrades our system to essentially meet a 10 to uh, five to 10 year design storm. Uh, depending on um, elevations and pitches that we can make work for this. So if I can jump to the next one, Joe. Second one was further up on Vernon Street. We identified a, a squished corrugated metal pipe. You can see uh, basically as the as the drainage goes from Cordis eventually down Whalen. Um, the rest of the system was all good. This one stretch um, unfortunately is deep and, and has um, a bunch of utilities that it has to cross. We're, we're estimating that to be somewhere in the $25,000 range or so to get that work done uh, prior to us paving. And if we can jump to the next one, Joe. And then the last one is really kind of what we would envision as our kind of um, our, our yearly ask. Um, you can see as we're, as we're adding more roads to the roads program, we have more drainage that we have to Im improve. So you can see from the chart there on the bottom right, if you, if you look at um, each of the different fiscals as we've gone through, Fiscal 20, we were only doing about a mile and some change at a drainage cost of improvements that we identified around you know, $45,000. As we continue to improve um, and, and add more roads, um, fiscal 21, we're up to two and a half, about two and a half miles of road and that cost jumped to about 260. We're anticipating that that'll be the, the, the annual ask going forward um, once we level out with the roads program. Um, but in 22, we're, you know, we're in a, a, a situation where we're putting out close to six miles worth of roadway and, uh, you know, a much, um, you know, a, a much larger jump. So almost close to $400,000 worth of work um, that we've identified just for drainage pipe to um, get that done prior to paving the streets that we have planned. So in total, that gives us that, um, you know, the, the, the total ask of the $900,000. Uh, next slide, Joe. So second point, um, and I'll go into as much detail as we want, as, as the committee here wants to go into, but um, I'm sure we all recall the issues with the quiet zone um, that we had. We were notified Excuse from- Excuse me, Bill. Yeah, take yeah. them one at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. was just gonna ask if, uh, if the committee had any questions from the, uh, the drainage. Sure, okay.
Doug? Uh, sure, like the, the 1A, which is looks like the big ticket item in terms of the townwide drainage improvements. Sure. Um, so that's, that's 475,000 or so. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and then, but I'm confused, like that just happened, you know, there, there was just damage there last year, but we've had much worse storms in the past yep. 10 years. It's something go us awry there, or is it something that just happened one time that we, are we fixing a problem that happened once last year and then we shouldn't like, are we spending $475,000 to like, you know, to solve what is maybe a $25,000 check every 10 years for people? No, I, I don't think we are. So we also identify problems in Daniel Road. So that's what I was talking about a couple of different things there. So we identified an issue in Daniel as well, um, where we have so, you know um, a corrugated metal pipe that doesn't have a bottom to it that we would already have had to replace. And that would have been a good stretch of this. Um, so basically what you're seeing in the green and in the blue was identified as another problem already that was a couple of years ago. And then the last flooding problem that we had um, was related really to the area in the red and trying to collect all of that drainage and get it into the, into the piping system. So you know, what, what's happened in the past is that it's flooded and ba basically gone into different directions. But ultimately this is definitely an undersized system that needs an upgrade. Um, and, you know, our, once we evaluated, you know, what upgrades were needed, this is what we're recommending as the, as the repair. So it's trying to correct a few issues. Yeah, I guess I'm just always concerned about like doing essentially, you know, two and a half blocks for $500,000 um, for something that has been a problem, but hasn't really resulted in, you know, much damage to property. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think with the drainage, I mean, we, it, it's kind of difficult to say, I mean, when do you, how much damage do you want to allow to have happen before we, you know, would add that into as a project? I mean, that, that's an interesting question to ask for sure. You know, I don't know, but. Um, I mean, the question becomes like how many puddle, like how much, you know, how much minor flooding are you going to take responsibility for throughout the town? Like if this is, if we solved all of these problems, it would be probably $20 million everywhere in town. So maybe maybe I'm mistaken, but I, I just- I mean, I, I think if we looked at it to, in its totality and took a step back, looking at all of the drainage in town, I mean, in the investment that we've made historically um, yeah. in drainage improvements, I mean, this is, you know, you would see that this is a drop in the bucket compared to probably the totality of work that we have to do. So what I'm trying to do is to is to to um, to hit most of these as we go through the roads program and as we add, you know, streets and paving. So I'm looking at you know essentially any uh, clay pipe that has cracks and whatnot. We're going to look to replace those. We're looking at corrugated metal pipes that that rust on the bottom and essentially don't have an invert. We replace those. So you know we we've been starting to do that, um, but historically. You know, we have we have been very underfunded um, for our you know drainage system, much like we were with the roads. Um, you know, and 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 this would be the recommendation to correct a couple of issues that I've identified in my my review of the drainage in the area. So, right. and by the way, hats off to you. You guys were on our street <laughs> this week, and you well, found got... a problem at my neighbor's house by snaking a camera through it. So, it was uh, it was you know. Uh, you know, I think, and the guys, you know, seem to be friendly and seem to be working hard. So, yeah, I, and you know, I, I think you know we're looking at all of these structures. We we have new data too, so that that's another big piece of this. So we didn't really have a, a, a good inventory. So that's something new that we've added to the system. So we've gone and done, you know, essentially a townwide inventory of all of these areas. Um, and, and, you know, as part of that, we included a condition assessment as well, so that we know as we're getting into streets, which streets we want to be looking at for stretches. Um, this is probably the bigger, uh, one of the biggest ones you'll see. Um, but again, you know, I also would say that it's probably cheaper compared to something of this, this type of run, because a big portion of this goes cross country. So we don't have to pay to pave on top of it either. So that also helps with this. So. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, Dan. Yeah, um, thanks. So I, I saw this slide and I said, this, this can't be right. There must be something going on here that I'm, that I'm missing. 
-hmm. that right now White Circle to Vernon Street is 18 inches and mm -hmm. Vernon Street <laughs> to Delano Lane is 12. And I'm going, who the devil engineered that one? If That's you got an 18, 18 inch going to 12. So is there something else going on here? Or is this really what's there and there's no other pipes? I mean, do we really have an 18 going to a 12? We do. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do. Yes, we do. Yep. And that 12, that uh, you can see a photo of the 12 essentially ripping out of the ground with the force of the water going through it. So. Oh, uh, yeah. sad. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Dan, Dan, if I, could comment I, I was I was hoping that was a typo. <laughs> no, no, and unfortunately it's not. Dan, if I could just add to that, that's something, uh, if you were to look at our drainage data, um, you'd see probably more times than you want to be uh, comfortable with seeing. I, for whatever reason, when, when drainage was, was getting put in, um, it was almost like it was done ad hoc. Nobody was really thinking about where point A was and where point B was. And case in point, you have a uh, an 18 connecting two pieces of larger infrastructure. So you, you essentially built yourself your own problem coming for the future. Yeah. Very good. All right. I don't see any other questions on the drainage. Thanks, Bill. It'll bounce forward. Sure. So quiet zone. Um, so little background. Back in November, um, we received notice from the Federal Rail Administration. Uh, that we were not able to reopen the Broadway crossing and maintain our quiet zone. Um, that was shut down for an open cut to be done for National Grid's work. Um, there was some protections that were designed back in the 90s that um, essentially didn't necessarily meet the requirements um, of the, the quiet zone program. So in December, I ended up uh, filing an amended notice of establishment to shut down Broadway temporarily. Um, we were hoping at the time that was going to be a three-month situation that um, obviously lasted a lot longer than that. Um, with As part of that, we also um, submitted a public authority application to, um, to essentially evaluate the credits at all of our crossings in town. So while Broadway was the road that was shut down, it actually was the entire town's uh, quiet zone that was out of compliance. So uh, we had some issues at Prospect Street um, with that um, the credits that were provided there. Um, as well as Albion Street and uh, Broadway. So it was kind of a three phase situation that we ended up having there. So um, we heard an initial response um, in January, back, back one sec, Joe. So we, we, um, so we heard a response from them back in January 21, um, you know, basically allowing us to keep that shut down and maintain the quiet zone. Um, first, you know, um, actual con conversations we had with them um, was in May of 21. Um, where they agreed with four of the six crossings and disagreed with my calculations for Prospect and Broadway. Um, so after many discussions, uh, we came up with an alternative. Um, if you can jump to the next one, Joe. So we ended up adding in, uh, so really what ended up being is that we had to add in Greenwood Street and a uh, new mountable median in Greenwood Street to be able to get our, our, our town's total below the horn threshold. Um, we had to make some modifications to the Broadway medians that were there. Um, and then we had to adjust how the credits were being taken for Prospect Street. Um, if we jump to the next one, Joe. So uh, that revision went back in and around June. Um, September, we received our, um, our approval of the ASMs and filed our new establishment. Uh, Broadway opened back up in October. So at that point, the big point to remember is that we, are, we were just barely underneath the threshold. So um, with all the work that we were we were do, that we did, <clears throat> essentially what ends up happening is any accident that happens by the tracks causes our metrics to change. Traffic increases on those crossings causes our metrics to to change, and we're on a, essentially a three year cycle to provide an update and more information back to FRA to maintain the quiet zone. So we're trying to stay ahead of that. Um, so we're our clock started in October of twenty one for three years for us to refile, um, and. What we identified the needs to be is we, essentially what we need are uh, quad gates. And we're envisioning that to get this below so that we don't have to have any um, you know, worries of, of future quiet zone compliance problems is that we would install new quad gates at two locations. Um, uh, and, and we've identified about three um, locations that we would identify as, as possible um, as possible quad gate spots. So it would either be Prospect Street, Albion Street, um, or Broadway. 
in all likelihood, Broadway would be in because it, it has the most traffic to date. Although the pandemic has shifted some of the traffic around, so we'll evaluate that in the upcoming, um, you know, for successful a town meeting to get the funding for this. Um, we've also gone af after some um, some grants through the Christie program, which is um, a real infrastructure uh, safety improvement grant that's done by the uh, federal um, uh, federal government, as well as a request for an earmark from our delegation, which actually has come through for about one point two million dollars. So. The request at town meeting would be $2 million. Um, that $2 million would essentially allow us to receive certain amounts of grant funds and then as much money as we would need up to the $2 million to get that second quad gate in. Um, so, you know, with costs of, of steel and other, you know, in, um, you know, and other materials going up, you know, the, the, the idea of having that a little bit of extra buffer to make sure that we can, um, you know, construct all of this and make it all happen within the timeframes um, is, is pretty imperative. So. I'd be happy to answer any questions on the quiet zone. Um, I had uh, one question. Um, um, has the town ever considered um, attempting to get rid of uh, some or all of our crossings in a similar fashion to how uh, Winchester um, dealt with theirs? And uh, one of the reasons why I bring this up now is I know we're kind of under a time crunch with the um, uh, the current repairs that need to get go in um, as quickly as possible, um, hence, hence the need for that $2 million. Um, but with our current expenses, plus the uh, anticipation of future growth, um, which would most likely um, almost guarantee future expenses, um, I guess, What's the uh, what's the threshold uh, for us? I guess um, you know uh, either continuing to fix these and upgrade these crossings every few years versus uh, just getting rid of a crossing altogether. Well, we we have looked at it, so I mean that's that's how we were able to um, to get the. Uh, to maintain the quiet zone was by shutting down Broadway. So we definitely evaluated all of those. Um, with Broadway being the the ha having the most traffic. Um, that obviously wasn't the one that we wanted to shut down. So, you know, ultimately, um, you know, like if we were to shut down Greenwood, for example, that wouldn't, um, that wouldn't get us low enough. Um, you know, what, what we see here is that, you know, this isn't, um, these quad gains aren't going to be town maintained. So what we do is essentially gift these to the MBTA and then we, you know, we install them, they take ownership of them and then maintain them going forward. So this is essentially a one-time cost for us to, to ensure that we have the quiet zone. Um, interesting situation though, is that MBTA as essentially the, the, the operator of that rail line um, is not a fan of the quiet zone. So they're really not, they have no problem blowing the horns going through town. So this really is a town initiative. Um, so in order to get and maintain the quiet zone and the, and the, the uh, essentially the, the quality of life that you get from not having the train horns blow, um, the, you know, essentially this is the cost of doing business. And this gets us well below the threshold. So that's, that's the intent here is that this is a one-time um, cost. I would not be expecting to be doing any more improvements aside from just my, my, you know, every three year filings with the, um, you know, with the, with federal rail, this would essentially be the set it, forget it scenario. Um, yeah. And just to clarify too, um, one of the um, the items that I was talking about regarding uh, the uh, the the at grade crossings mm -hmm. is to change the grade essentially, um, either uh, the street going uh, up, you know below the tracks or the tracks coming up above the street, um, in, in in a fashion that that Winchester executed. I'm, I'm not sure when, but I'm sure a long time ago. <clears throat> Yeah, I, and I, I think what you would run into here, though, is that you know we're we're constrained in all of these locations. That's one of the big reasons why we had the non-compliance component with the quiet zone, is because we have you know really uh, businesses in other driveways that are adjacent to all of these. So I was really limited on what I could actually do. So looking at trying to separate the grades here, um, it's just really not feasible with the current infrastructure setup. Uh, so I, I, we just you know, we have a couple already, right? So we do have a couple of bridges that go over. Um, you know, and they have been done where they can. But um, if you think about it, we really have, you know, uh, essentially North Ave or Main Street running against the tracks at every point, um, trying to get over all of those 
um, you know, is just definitely not something financially feasible. This is by far a much better bang for your buck. Let's put it that way. And Joe, uh, sorry, uh, Bill, you did say the uh, federal uh, funds uh, come in for, would say, 1.2? Yeah, we've been identified. Steve, uh, 1.2. I believe is the number, right? We we worked with our um, uh, congressional delegation. Um, Seth Moulton really spearheaded this. Um, he pushed it through the House as part of one of their big spending bills. Jim, your favorite things. Um, and um, uh, the Senate pushed it through their side and uh, President Biden has signed it. Um, so we should be getting that money. They always say shortly, but... Uh, <laughs> I never, I never believe it until we have it in hand. So, um, yeah. but uh, real uh, working closely with our delegation and with our engineering department and help of uh, citizens uh, that took a big bite out of this. Yep. Yep. Great. No, it's a good story. Yep. Just wanted to clarify that, uh, Doug. Sure. So the and trust a couple things. Uh, the grant. So the is it two million plus the grant money? for this or is it the grant money is included in the 2 million? The grant money is included in the 2 million. Right. All right, yeah. so we get based, on my, that's based on my current estimates. So that's based on the last estimate I did, which would have been about probably six months ago or so, but um, that had some, that also had some contingency money in it. So I'm pretty comfortable we can get all that done for 2 million. We're and also sort of, applying for discretionary grants on top of the 1.25. We are, so it, we, could have we could have no tax impact. That's a potential, so but we still need to get moving on. Unfortunately, the timing to get this approved, installed and all of that stuff through the EMBTA process, I, I need the time now to get this and, and meet my three-year deadline, so. Oh yeah, no, that, I, I think that's fine. How much have we spent on it so far? Like how much have we spent? Because we had to spend, yeah, to spend a bunch of money, right? To get the four gates in and whatnot. Um, to date? No, no, no. So this, we have the, we don't have four gates anywhere at this point. We don't have quad gates. Okay. We have, so what we did is we uh, essentially had a, I want to say about a hundred thousand, maybe $80,000 total um, so far to get that all compliant. That's about what the cost was. So we're able to leverage some existing contracts that we had. Um, you know, my office did all the design work um, and the filing. So basically that was a no impact to the tax, you know, to the, to the taxpayer. So, um, you know, that, that saved us a significant chunk of dough. Um, and then, you know, the, you know, the, um, the basically it was really just some curbing and some sidewalk and some paving. So. And so, and Steve, and maybe Jim can remind me, how much are we getting from national grid a year once the thing goes in? Um, I think the initial increase, if I'm not mistaken, was 1.6 million. All right. So national grid, you know, sort of caused this problem, but they, so it eats into that first year of money we get from them. I assume we can't get any money from them for screwing this up, right? I would we've, definitely, I, we've, we've definitely got our fair share beyond that, <laughs> to be honest with you. So with that crossing, we got a, a sizable water main replacement through the crossing that was close to about $400,000. Um, we've got some additional paving money on top of what they're going to do. So we've been okay. able to leverage it for some other funds for sure, um, just to be clear. So, um, and, and I would say, I, unfortunately, it's not, it, it's, it wasn't caused by National Grid. I would say that National Grid highlighted the deficiency in the town's original filing. Right. Yeah, um, it was, we screwed and, up and, and it was just, got it. it would have yeah. never gotten to anybody if National Grid hadn't been going through it. That's very accurate. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That, yeah, that's a better way to put it. It's always the big utility's fault. Yes. I like it. I'm, I'm, I'll agree with you then. I like that. <laughs> and and don't forget the uh, national grid 1.6 is uh, runs multi-year. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm. Yep. I, um, Dennis. So if we all, if we made national grid originally jacket. Instead of open cut, we wouldn't have been in this situation now. <laughs> no, no. I, well, they still had to go into those areas, so the the pits would have been in the location of where the um, of where the um, where the islands were. So they would have had to replace them. So that would have still triggered the same situation. And actually, it wasn't the town that required them to open cut it. It was the MBTA that did. They prefer the open cut, which it does. It's 
counterintuitive to me um, as an engineer, but that's what they, they preferred. Oh, so they're the one who dictated it. Then. They oh. dictated the open cut, but if we were to go with the jack and bore method, which was what was originally planned, both of those pits were in the locations of the of where the um, of where those islands were. So it still would have been identified as an issue. I, I think we would have been in the same spot regardless. Wow. All right. Okay. Did you find Pretty out good. tell us about uh, Wilmington? About the accident at Wilmington? Yeah. Um, I know th all I know about it was that there was an issue. There was an issue with the gate, and it was something done with the maintenance that happened to it. Is what I heard. So there was it, there was something to do with the it, when it failed. It was related to some either a switch or something that didn't get turned back on. To put it, I guess, in layman's terms, but that's what it was. Human error, Dennis. Human error Human by error. the signalman. Human error by the signalman. Yeah. Said, I, said, understand, I understand that portion of it, but I thought they, they were going to replace the gates, the quad gates in that area as a result of this act. Yeah, probably due to the age of them. So that would be so once we install these and get the credit for it, then these would be replaced by the MBTA on their maintenance schedule going forward. No, I'm just saying we were going to find out who was paying for these this great crossing upgrade in Wilmington. Whether it's the town, the feds, or the NBA. Yeah, I, I'd have to look back into that. I know that was a question before. I I, it, I didn't get a response, but I, I'll follow back up. I do have some context there. So, okay. Dennis, Dennis, after we talked last week, I've been playing phone tag with a few people that I know that are working over there. So, hopefully, I'll have that answer for you, or at least a, a little bit better of a, of a guesstimation for you um, in the short term. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. Very good. Next article, I think. Oh, I think this is you. So um, the Hartsville Water Storage Tank. So uh, the request here uh, from Public Works is to bond $5 million uh, to replace this. So uh, I'll give you a quick history on it. Um, this tank, the simplest way I can explain its function in a water distribution system is this essentially is our distribution systems expansion tank, uh, very similar to the one that most of you have in the heating systems in your home. Um, this is made out of bolted steel and was installed in 1927. So we are getting very close to the centennial mark uh, with this piece of infrastructure. Uh, she sits 47 feet wide at just shy of 50 feet high and it stores uh, 640,000 gallons. So not to get uh, completely uh, technical on you with this, but um, as far as providing some pressure uh, control, um, this, this tank is also the system control point for all of our feeds to the MWRA. So depending on the level of this tank, uh, the feeds that come in off of um, Prospect Street, Albion Street, and then down at Linden Street and Greenwood, uh, open and closed based on what the data from our SCADA is telling us here. Uh, this tank provides equalization uh, of water pressure when we have our plant online and we might be under fire flow condition. It's also there to provide buffering capacity for uh, high demand fluctuations and it provides passive surge relief to upland and lowland areas when we have velocity changes in town. Um, for anybody that might be in the medical field, if it's an event like that, it almost acts like a blood pressure bag for the town of Wakefield. Um, so the ask is for design, uh, plans, specification, and document prep, project management, and construction services. So to date, uh, the only thing that we have done through our operating budget is we've performed essentially a feasibility study. And the first question we looked to answer was, do we even need this tank? Or can we do alternative repairs uh, that are less disruptive and be able to get the same performance out of our system? Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the answer is no. The amount of money it would take to mitigate this is in the tens of millions of dollars, and it's not something that the enterprise uh, can handle at this point in time. The other things that we've done uh, is figured out the survey and whether or not we could fit a concrete tank up here or a tank made out of uh, what we would likely end up having to go with, which is a combination of fiberglass and bolted steel again. So we're at the point now uh, where we figured out what can we can fit up here. 
uh, that we can't replace it with something alternative. Um, so the only option left is to come up with a plan to try to rebuild it and put something new uh, in service. So what the new tank might look like is a out of the box kit. Um, it's about a half a foot higher and two feet wider. We pick up uh, 40,000 gallons of storage capacity. So it points us at uh, 0.68 mg. And the material that this will be made out of is fiberglass and bolted steel. Um, this is something that we've been looking at this, we've been talking about it for a little while. Um, from this point in time, from today till fiscal 24, we have approximately $300,000 in debt that's going to be coming off of the water uh, enterprise books. So much like uh, Mr. Mayo's approach with the um, turf fields when the library came off, I believe it was, uh, we'll be looking to talk to bond council and build this payment in so that uh, it happens as the debt falls off and we provide as little of an impact to the rate structure as we can. Uh, using four, four and a half percent uh, as our guide for some of the estimations. It appears if it hits the high side on that time, by the time this goes online, we could be looking at about $70,000 uh, in debt. If the interest rate comes in much lower, uh, we're gonna get pretty close to budget neutral. So we have our fingers crossed that that's gonna be the scenario that plays out for us. Very good, Ed. So how quickly would you wanna move on this? You just said an interest rate of what, four, four, four and a half? So that's a bond. That's a very, problem. it's a you know reasonably conservative estimate. Rates are going up, so I'm just yeah, just right. wondering what your time frame is going to be on this, assuming this gets approved. So depending on uh, what bond council tells us, um, likely uh, our estimate for putting it uh, up and constructed, uh, we look to fall 2023. It would be online. Um, if we could stage the payments out, um, we would bond now. Uh, but I would I would defer to bond council, the town treasurer. Uh, and Kevin uh, for a little bit broader conversation on that. But, you know, we're, we're essentially ready to go uh, with a portion of it now, and then we could, we could ban into the next stage of the debt coming out of the enterprise. Yeah, I would be very interested in hearing uh, the financing plan for that. Uh, I don't know what the asset life is uh, for, for this type of an asset. I'd be curious, I don't know if that's 20, 30 years or whatnot. But, um... So uh, bond, bond, you can bond this for 20 years. Um, the, asset life to this uh, is at minimum 30. Uh, we have some cost of service related to that, but I, I can provide the summary that we got from our water consultant that helped us uh, design the spec from this. It covers a little bit of that. Yeah, I would be interested in that. Yeah, thank you. Sure. All right, very good. And I don't see any other hands. Okay, sorry, I'm just taking a note. Yep. Okay. Um, next up on the docket, uh, refuse and recycling. For fiscal 23, uh, the request is for $2,292,046. Uh, it's up a little bit over 4%, 92,604.96 from fiscal uh, 22. Uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, not to beat on the pandemic drum too much, but uh, we didn't really know where refuse was going to be. Uh, we had just come off of a substantial increase in what it cost us to dispose of our refuse at the incinerator in Haverhill. We went from about $60 a ton to $90 a ton. And, you know, the more you turned on the news and started reading into it, they were telling you about the recycling markets in China closing and it being harder to take the commodities and process them. Uh, luckily, it seems that uh, the pandemic surge that initially happened is starting to tail off. If you actually were to put our fiscal year tonnages um, and compare them uh, to a trend line, refuse is actually trending down and recycling is trending up. So that was nice to see that happen uh, in that direction. The big increases here um, on the contractual services side, uh, recycling. If you remember when we did the JRM contract, the first year they level funded uh, their monthly cost to us for nine months so we could align our contract with the fiscal years. They also did the same thing with the refuse budget. Uh, on the refuse budget, at the time we were going out for recycling, we asked them if the pricing would change uh, for refuse collection, if we were to do both of them combined, and it did. And that reflects the $6,200 change you see there. Uh, that's a net savings from the previous contract 
in place of about $25,000. Uh, outside of that, you see the disposal of refuse is a 3% increase to this year's rate at uh, $95.48 a ton. Yard waste processing, uh, gravel, brush, street sweepings uh, is all been level funded. Uh, we have some contractual increases related to our staff's time at the yard waste site uh, and some of the days that we operate on, on holidays and things like that. I will say included in this number uh, for labor and overtime uh, is the expansion of the hours of the yard waste site on Sundays. So now both days will be open uh, when they're open on the schedule from 8.30 to 4. Um, we normally would do an education program uh, out of this article. Uh, unfortunately, um, personally, you know, it's not it's not our place right now to engage the schools and, and talk about uh, having 120 kids come into an auditorium and, and put on um, a show or some sort of learning environment. Um, you know, they have their own things that they have to figure out. And then um, the person that we contracted with to help us that came in and sang songs and really provided a, a cool little thing for the kids is actually retired. Um, so we have removed that for this year uh, in hopes we'll find something to replace it. Uh, we just couldn't time it out uh, for this budget cycle. And then lastly, just a quick note in here on the contingency line item. Uh, if you go back to when I spoke on this, uh, the pandemic again, we bumped that up to 10%, uh, not knowing what the surge on the street was going to look like with everybody being driven home. Uh, we've reduced that this year to our regular 7.5% that we have been using for our contingency um, for probably the past 20 years. So if you were to total all that up, you're 232 excuse me, 2392046. And we're actually included in a tonnage offset. So with the uh, tonnage going down or trending downward at the street, and then the policy that the council voted on last year where they were charging for bulk items, uh, we feel that $100,000 will be saved next year, resulting in our total ask for 2292046. Very good. Any questions? And there is a spreadsheet in the in the packet uh, giving you these same uh, same data points, I believe. So, anyone? Okay. Um, I you know when we went, when we met with the uh, subcommittee, it was good to hear. Uh, you know, there was some concern last year, I think the year before, about the recycling and, and uh, the possible cost uh, skyrocketing. So it was good. Joe seemed to temper that and, and have a more relaxed approach. So we were happy to hear that. Obviously, it makes great sense to recycle. Uh, uh, just a quick question. Um, did you get much uptake on the whole, like, uh, the, we were going to do cardboard ourselves and bring it to the plant? We did. So um, believe it or not, um, we ended up being uh, positive in the cash flow for that. Um, the numbers aren't super, super impressive to the point where they're going to knock one of these line items completely out of the budget. But um, you know, we were cash flow positive uh, and we did provide a convenience feature that when the hot street closed, uh, we had actually people actually calling us to, to see if there were any other any other options. Unfortunately, we didn't have that. Um, I think Ann might have the actual numbers of, of what we disposed of uh, and what we saw for revenue. Yeah, so we um, we had we did about five uh, five ton out of the um, container at the at the uh, pit, and it came to just under four ninety nine sixty. We got in our reimbursement for that. So it not only we got a little money, but it also took it possibly out of the uh, trash stream. Okay. And then how did you do in terms of sales so far of the, the $20 stickers? How is that going? Yeah, we've sold uh, about 20, a little over 2,700 stickers. We're at about uh, $51,000 um, for revenue. Okay. And then another program that's helped, we think, in the trash stream is the um, Black Earth, where we negotiate a contract with the, them for uh, preferred pricing. And so we have 371 people who currently have a weekly pickup of Black Earth uh, compost. I know I was one of the suckers who did it before you guys set up the deal. Um, hey, so we're gonna, um, 
and was successful in getting another year for the recycling dividends grant. So we're actually going to, we have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, we have 130 or 140 more to get to the next pricing threshold. Yes, 130. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna come out relatively soon with another incentive for people to try to drive the cost down a little bit more, Doug. Doug, it sounds like it's perfect for you. No, where they get you is the bags. The, the compostable bags cost you. Like, you know, that's, that's uh, it's, you know, the chic razor, the razor and blades mentality. So. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Any other comments, uh, anyone on the recycle and refuge? Okay. One more. Yes. Uh, last but certainly not least is everybody's favorite $1 article. Um, Eminent Domain, this is our annual article to allow us to take small scale property easements to facilitate uh, some of the initiatives that we do related to drains, roads, sidewalks, and water sewer utility. Um, kind of on the same mantra as the Broadway article, this is a break glass in case of emergency thing that we use uh, very infrequently, but it's important to highlight just in case uh, we need to exercise this option for ourselves. Very good. And that's the extent of the DPW articles then, correct? Yes. Yep. That is everything. Great. All right. Any other general comments from anyone for the team? Congratulations. I think this is the first time uh, weekly recycling didn't come up in like, you know, a bunch of years. <laughs> we, have yep. the, we have the number for you if you want to know. All right. Appreciate you guys coming tonight. And uh, the uh, I, I guess the town council asked about trees, about shade trees. But uh, other than that, uh, they reviewed a few items uh, Monday. I, I sat in on that. So appreciate the, the team. Nice work. And uh, you guys cover a lot of ground every month and every year. So uh, I, I know I appreciate it and glad to be part of the subcommittee. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I, I have my homework, so I'll be sending you a couple of follow-up documents uh, this week. Thank you very, very much. Good. Thanks, everyone. Take care. All right. Um, Joe, can you pull your screen down? Sharing. I'm trying to figure that out. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can. Maybe I uh, you know what I think? I'll just, I'll sign off. My apologies. There you go. Oh, now you're back on. Oh, uh, Jim, while, while he's doing that, yep. a, a follow-up question for uh, Steve. Um, in the memo from Joe to you and the town council, there was a couple of other items. Um, let's see, the Marla Lane Roadway Betterment. Yeah, uh, I think that, is the one. That yeah. one has now been dropped, as I understand it. I, I think that the uh, neighborhood yes. is coming together on that, so it's not ready for us yet. Yes, uh, Dan, they, they couldn't reach consensus on that, so uh, that's been deferred for now. Okay. So otherwise, I think that list is, um, yeah, I think that's the only one that on your on that right. memo that's been dropped. Great. Steve, this won't let me exit it. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm gonna think I'm gonna do this. All right, I think we're good. Bye everyone. There you go. Okay. Um, okay, that was the uh, the bulk of the information that we were going to cover tonight. I did have uh, town hall meeting minutes that we didn't have a quorum for earlier that I'd like to go back to. That's uh, all right. Yeah. I don't. I think you still don't have a quorum. Oh, I thought there was somebody else that came on. That. I'm uh, sorry. Nope. Uh, maybe, but not for that. Not for that. Oh, no, no, no. Don and uh, yeah, Don and Evan. Got okay. it. Sorry. Much bigger group, but not enough for the right people. Yep. We'll defer that. Yep. Um, 
the only other thing that I got from Steve tonight that I'll send along is uh, the summary of budgets to date. Um, I, I could share it, I guess, if you want, but, but you know, the spreadsheet that I, I keep referring to after each town council meeting, Steve or uh, Kevin updates the, uh, the, the running budget list. And so uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, DPW has been added. And, and uh, so you, you sent that over to me just uh, today, Steve, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so but anyway, I'll share that with the group, uh, set, probably just on a separate email, but the, uh, you know, with the DPW snow and ice, the subtotal was 2.5, 2.05, is that right, Steve? No. The subtotal uh, with the schools and everything is at uh, 5.28. Um, Mr. Chairman, this might be a good segue to my forecasting spreadsheet, which I updated today. Sure, you like want to share? You yeah, want to share in I'd, chat? Yeah, I'd like to share and if Steve could give me. I, um... I think you. I think I gave them to you already, Dan. You you should be able to do it. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Uh, okay. Can you guys see the spreadsheet? Not yet. Oh, I must have done something wrong. Back. I'm gonna do. It's, I have a stop share. Let me try again. Maybe I have to do a duplication of my screen to make it work. Let me try it again. How's that? There you go. Yep. Got it now. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. So um, I spent some time with um, Steve and Kevin this morning, making sure we're all on the same page and reconciled to where the budgets are. Um, we still have a couple yet to, um, to add to this list. I think um, I used the school numbers that, they, that we got from them uh, two weeks ago. I added the, the health insurance. Um, and I think that was, I think those are the last, oh, and the 50,000, dollars of miscellaneous articles, right? So that is the other piece. So I think this is where we are today and probably where we will be um, when we get around to, to voting. Um, I adjusted the spreadsheet a little bit to include the total department budgets um, and other costs and so forth and add that up to um, 112 million but then what I did is I moved um, the transfers. So where um, we're transferring to sewer and water um, and light department, various costs, I added that uh, as a separate tab and referenced the value here. So I'm coming in at um, $108.1 million on tax levy. And then on the income side, um, I think everybody agrees to the, the 12.3 million from the state. Um, Steve and Kevin have $7 million for local receipts. Um, I've got 8.4, so you'll see that as a difference. Um, my 8.4 is based on the fact that we had 7.8 million in 21, and I just increased it with just um, a regular uh, 3% for the next two years to get um, my 8.4. Light department is there, 946 available funds. Um, and I can show where those numbers are coming from. This is stuff like the, the library has a trust that generates 60,000 change. Um, there's a perpetual care fund, DPW, cemetery sales, and some other stuff that comes in the 273 tax levy. Um, and the big nut here is the $3 million um, for the um, you know, the power lines going from Winchester to, to Wakefield. Um, so that's, a, I've got that in as an additional, roughly 1.3 million over uh, the prior year. And then it backs off in the following year, uh, it's because it's a one shot um, at regular increases, roughly 1.9 million. Um, this number might be a little bit low given some of the, the stuff that's coming online. 
and expected to come online in the coming um, months and years. So we'll see how that works out. So total income at, at 108.42. So we have a deficit of a whopping 50 grand. Um, now Steve will show a deficit of roughly 1.6 million, 1.5 million. It's all because of our differences on local receipts. I'm at 8.4 and, and he's at 1.5. And rumor has it that Kevin wanted to be lower than seven million. <laughs> um, Where did you put the ARPA money and all that stuff? And Dan, like, do you put that into like in terms of income, in terms of grants, or did you not put that into the ARPA money? Just gets spent. That's yeah, totally. It's separate. offset on the budgets. Um, I don't think I have any ARPA money in here except for the, I think the health department. Um, we're gonna have a $380,000 $380, on the health department. And what I did um, for health is for 23, this, this jumps up to the 383,000, but then we're gonna add 70,000 to that plus inflation to get 464 and 24, because if you remember, and when we discovered the, uh, discussed the health department, it's a seventy thousand dollar increase in twenty four, and another seventy thousand in, in twenty five, and then it becomes normal. So there was some ARPA money here, but so I netted it against uh, their budget. Yeah, just because I think in terms of the school number, the school number I think you have higher than they were showing because I think they were offsetting; they were using some of that. Money no, I, no I, 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 I am using their 47722 as our tax levy. So if, if they get any ARPA money, it's, it's not, it's separate and distinct from our tax levy. Oh, all right. No, you had 498, but then in the grand total, you showed the fiscal 22 to 23 of like five point something. So I assume that's where you put in the ARPA money. Uh, no, go back I, to your first sheet. This one that includes all education, not just high yeah. school. That's yeah, library. that's all education. Oh, the, that's yeah, all that's, education. Includes oh, okay. the library and, 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 and the voc. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, it includes library and voc. Yeah. Oh, okay, so the library and voc are oh, because the voc's growing by a lot. Is that true? Yeah. Because um, for the whole budget to be growing five point eight and the school to only be growing at five, yeah, must the, yeah, the, crazy the, numbers the, on the library. Yeah, the voc went up twenty five percent. Well, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a twenty-five, and and I, I'll share this spreadsheet with anybody who wants it. Not a, not a problem. Ed, you have so, a, your hand up. Well, I like to see the spreadsheet, of course, Dan. Uh, on terms of the school department, just getting back to their outside monies, like the ESSER monies or whatnot, I would be very interested in getting an accounting of what they have spent uh, with uh, their ESSA grants and uh, the relationship to the operating budget and what they're going to do in the fiscal year. That would be. Right, so as far as the schools, um, I don't remember if, if we shared it or not. Did I share it? The, uh, the quote unquote book, the budget book is available on the school website. Oh, did okay. I, so it's, if it's on the website, it? I'll go look for it. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, we that shared that both? before the piece. Okay. Say that, Doug. We did share it. Yeah, okay. I, I got I got these figures off of that same uh, website uh, okay. document. So they do net out the the uh, the money coming in, Ed. But as far as what's spent to date and stuff, uh, I'd have to double check it again. It may be in there, well, but I, I don't well, know. All. Well, Kevin, you would have that, right? You have the, you would have an accounting of what they spent to date, correct? No, we we do have the we get they do a monthly update. If you go to their, we can share that with you. I have, I have. But he's one. asking if Kevin Kevin would have it off of the uh, the off the, of the ledger, yeah. the ledger, the uh, the doc. Kev, you still there? No, I would just yeah. be interested yes. to see if they've spent down that all of their extra money and you know and, and yeah yeah, or what their plan is. All right. Okay. Um, and the, I mean, the other piece of good news, I mean, granted, it's only 50,000 based on my numbers, and it's only 1.5 million based on Steve's, which is actually lower than it has been in the past. But then if you see, you know, going forward, uh, based on the assumptions regarding growth of, uh, 
you know, income versus uh, growth of expenses. Um, we're running some positives. And if I scroll down to, you know, free cash, we're at about 4.8 million at the, uh, at the beginning of 23. And then it'll obviously, if we're, you know, having um, spending less than we're earning, it's free cash is gonna go up. So um, all in all, um, a much, much more positive picture than we had just two years ago. Right. So if anybody has any questions or, you know, if they, if they wanna copy the spreadsheet, I'll send it to, to Ed, but anybody else just drop me a line and I'll, I'll send you a copy of the, and you guys can play around with it yourselves. The contract negotiations might end up being problematic for that extra money, but we'll see. Yeah. And DPW uh, union, I'll take a little piece of that too. Yeah, I'll share it with the uh, school union uh, contract negotiator. <laughs> I think I think that's what Doug's referring to. <laughs> the school, everybody's, you know, everybody's yeah, up know. next year, aren't they? Steve, yeah. isn't isn't um, it teachers fire in? Is it teachers firing cops all at once? Um, I don't know about the teachers. I think they are, but police and teachers fire are, are up. Yeah, so teachers, I think every with all three are up. It's, it's teachers wow. are up as well. And and by the way, I'm holding I'm holding about ninety thousand dollars in my head um, for uh, for the um, DPW contract. Oh, 90? Okay, about ninety. Yeah, that was one thing that was driving me crazy. Why my numbers were different than Dan's because I already have it baked in. So that's um, that's probably a hard number. We've actually run that. And should I know. should I add the ninety thousand? I, I mean, no. I mean, it's not it's not done yet. But I may come back with a new budget. You can do it then. I don't want to screw you up. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. So where are right, the differences? Great, uh, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. So, yep. uh, Steve, where are the differences between you and uh, Dan in terms of local receipts? Uh, well, <laughs> um, the thing is that when we file with the DOR, we've been very conservative over the years. Um, if we were to show a huge increase, I think that would raise eyebrows. Um, I'd much rather um, and uh, utilize free cash to balance the budget in November, which is when we'll do it, um, based on a lower receipt number and be very, very pleasantly surprised than come back and look for more money at the end of the year. So we have a good relationship with, with the Department of Revenue. They like what we're doing. Um, we're moving it up a little bit every year. And you know, let's face it, local receipts, Although we have a great track record, who knows what will happen. So that's kind of our conservative chicken little, as Dan has told us, uh, method of, um, of doing that. But it's seemed to have worked. So Yeah, you'll see that. Well, um, we agree. We agree at the end of the day with the bottom. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's a matter. You know, I look at history and say, what is it been and where is it going? And so yeah. that's why I end up taking this number and bumping it up. Sure. Well, you agenda free cash and the DOR philosophy is conservative revenue estimates. Right. right. So that you generate free cash. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, we both have our positions and we're, both our positions are backed up by, you know, what's going on. We just understand there's going to be a difference and that's what it is. It's a, it's an annual discussion Ed. I have to say. <laughs> yeah. And Kevin owes me a lot of dinners. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Great. Any other comments? Anybody on this? All right, Dan. Great. Appreciate it. If uh, if you share it with, uh, I'll take a copy as well. I play around with it. Um, okay. Committee comments uh, at this point. Anyone? Okay. Now, who other than the schools do we have in two weeks? Yeah. So. Uh, the schedule of two weeks is, is both uh, the VOC and the school in the in the local schools. Those are the two items on uh, 331. What, what about that last articles? Uh, those will probably come at the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, we still have a meeting on uh, April 14. Right. And we Steve, still have with, healthcare. Yeah. Right. With, with, with the health and uh, capital planning, the, right. the, the last. Yeah. Right. And Steve, why do I have the, a list in front of me? So that, yeah, no, yeah. Steve, why do the schools meet with the I why do the schools meet with the town 
council the Monday because, before? Because uh, per, per the charter, they are, they are required to present their budget to the town council. Okay. Uh, did you have something? Yep. Yeah, just for uh, just to sure. let you know, the subcommittee on the capital planning met last night with the capital planning committee, and they finalized their vote. And Dan's spreadsheet of two point one million is exactly not only correct; it is to the penny. <laughs> Amazing how that worked. <laughs> Amazing how, how that Amazing. works. We don't now, know. A, a little little bird told me what the number ought to be. <laughs> All right. So don't forget everybody who is the chair or the designee of the subcommittee uh, for minutes. If you get get us the minutes, so that'd be uh, Steve and myself as timely as feasible and prior to the meeting, it's appreciated. Uh, and obviously we then will vote on those minutes at the next meeting. So uh, just from a procedural point, if you, if you are a chair, try to get the uh, minutes in um, so we can move it to, through the process. And, uh, and it's usually helpful for most of us when we look at it in advance. Any other committee comments? Steve, uh, anything, Kev? Uh, uh, no, I think we have most of our big budgets in. Um, the subcommittee for um, health insurance is meeting, I believe, next week, which is yeah. well before that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think what you see, uh, we did talk with uh, capital planning. We are looking to, um, in the future, ratchet that up, you know, 5% every year going forward. Um, that's a, it's about a 5% increase over last year, which is nice. Um, and yeah, other than that, I think we're in fairly good shape for the shape we're in. Yeah. <laughs> And just one observation, right? So that the chair of each subcommittee attends the town council meeting on yes. the, on the mon Monday before. Just uh, an observation, I, I would try to uh, not overshadow the department head. I would try to just give a brief overview of, of your subcommittee's opinion or, or opine briefly on, on the budget versus going through line items and things like that, because uh, Steve would do that or the department head does that. And and we're just giving our uh, the subcommittee feedback. I, I think it just in my observation, I, I've seen some of us go long-winded and some of us may be too short. So the point is the department head is there to present. We're just letting the uh, the town council know what your view was of your, uh, you know, your preview. So point of reference, all right. That's all I have, I think, anybody else? Very good. Appreciate uh, everybody that could make it tonight, and we'll I'll move, see you. I'll move to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. I'll second. All right. I'll see you in uh, two weeks and a day. And uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Right. Hang up. <laughs> Thank you all. Take yeah. care. Bye-bye. Yeah,